Well, listen, you're, you're in for a treat. Homegrown. If um, these are goodies over here, so make sure you uh, don't leave without getting some. Uh, Patrick Durkin uh, is quite an author. Uh, how many read his column on Saturday night in the journal? Look at the hands. There's a lot of people. Just some of the recent columns. Committee decides CWD isn't all that urgent. This guy is feisty. I like it. Diverse groups unite for conservation fund. Why hunt? Leopold's passion still resonates. His, um, his accomplishments are many. Um, Durkin will discuss how Wisconsin has reduced funding for research on CWD and how this has affected the monitoring of it in recent years. He is an award-winning outdoor writer, freelance newspaper columnist, and general outdoors reporter. He was named contributing editor of the Archery Trade Association and writes for National Archery and Hunting Magazines. In addition to 18 Wisconsin newspapers that carry his column, including the Stevens Point Journal, he also is wildlife research editor for Meat Eater, American Hunter Magazine, and editor-at-large of Inside Archery Trade Magazine. Please welcome Patrick Durkin speaking about wasting disease, chronic wasting disease is spreading, can it be stopped? Just a sound check here. How's the sound back? Good. I'll try using this thing, but I have to run the mouse too, so if I, if I stumble, I'll put this down and just uh, talk louder. Um, but I first want to say thanks a lot for having me come over here. I, I live over in Primopaca, and when I got this invitation, I thought, okay, this is not very far. It's a friendly group. I hear from, I hear from people quite often in the Stevens Point in Rapids area because my column does appear over here and also in Marshfield and up in Wausau so uh, it's nice to see a, a full room because I've had it happen quite often where I I'm sorry you're, you're motioning to me oh no I'm sorry <laughs> I thought you were trying to tell me something <laughs> reminds me of one of those jokes where people are doing the auctioneer the auctions and they start <laughs> anyway um, one thing I want to say too is when I was sitting here in the in the room watching this thing, is the reason this up is up on the screen right now is because it took a team effort tonight to get this thing up here. <laughs> I showed up with my lap, my own laptop computer, not realizing there was no connections for it here. So that set up a whole chain of events where one man went out and bought me a flash drive, brought it in, and then and then that time, some other guy out here got this thing turned on, then this nice lady here, young lady, got this thing to figure out how to communicate to that screen. <laughs> and finally I could relax and you know what my, my thing would be here. Well then I sit down, and of course I'm a, I'm a copy editor also. I, a big part of my work is copy editing. So I'm looking at this um, headline up here, and I'm thinking, God, I hope there's no typos. <laughs> I checked it five times now and it's, it reads fine because those kind of things drive me nuts. Um, the other thing, too, you might notice here is that um, I, won't be, I won't be showing you pictures of lots of big bucks I've shot because I haven't shot that many big bucks. Yet. So when I go out and do talks, I don't do all the how to stuff and the straight hunting and all the, all the deer hunting stuff usually. Um, but I. On a serious note, I have been covering chronic wasting disease pretty extensively since it was found in our state. It's now been 16 and a half years since we first got the news in February 2002 that we had this disease in our state. And I'm just going to experiment here, moving my screen down a little bit. I'm not an expert on CWD. I never pretend to be. But I, but I do talk to a lot of CWD experts. And spent, I've gotten no quite a few of them around the country now. And so I, I like to think that I'm, I've gotten good at understanding their lingo and translating it, transferring it to my readers. So I feel, I feel confident saying that, that I'm a good, I think I'm a good translator, but I'm not an expert on CWD. But um, 
I do really fear that we'll reach a point down the road, not very far in the future, where our deer herds are going to start declining. We're already, you'll see in some of these charts I have, how bad the disease has gotten in the last 16 and a half years. And when I talk about big bucks, there isn't going to come a time when Wisconsin, the way it's going right now, will not have many big bucks just because they'll be dead before they get to an age where they can grow these, these monster racks that Wisconsin has been famous for for, for decades. And, but like I say, more on that later. <coughs> this will work now. There we go. Now, you might not recognize this guy, but this is me <laughs> in 1975. And if, you probably can't make it out, but, um, but it, in that picture is uh, one of the original compound bowls, an Allen compound bowl. And this is my first buck with a bow and arrow. And for me, it was kind of, I think, kind of haunting about this picture is not just the fact that I had hair as a 19-year-old kid. <laughs> but that, um, this buck was shot in Iowa County, right in the heart of what is, what is now our CWD endemic area. And I, it's um, a little town, maybe, I think, I think it, the one, there's one store there, and maybe a couple of homes and trailer homes, and a little town called Hyde, H-Y-D-E. I, I think it's like County H or County T down there. But that's where I got that buck. And about three months after I shot this buck, I was in the Navy, ended up in the Navy for five years. When I came back in 1980, late 1980, I went back to that same farm and was hunting, and there was wild turkeys. And that was just an amazing thought, you know, that I left, came back five years later, later and all of a sudden there's wild turkeys running around that area, just thick. And then, of course, 20 years goes by, and 22 years goes by, and then um, CWD pops up. So there's this whole roller coaster of emotions for a person like me that grew up in, grew up in Madison, the west side of Madison, saw this wonderful thing like wild turkeys come along, saw the wild deer herd just boom during those, during those years, and now we're, we're facing this. So, I'm going to put on some more here. And just in case you don't know where Iowa County is and, and, um, and Hyde, it's, if you know where the town of Barnerville is, on Highway 18151, it's just north of there by eight miles. Now, I was thinking about this one when I put up this stuff about a little bit of my bio. I read years ago that when you, once you get to be age 50, you should, you should be kind of careful about sending out your resume to potential employers because it starts advertising how old you are. <laughs> but now that I'm 62, I don't really worry about that too much. My goal now, I've been freelancing for about 19, 18, 19 years. My goal now is to remain unemployable. <laughs> I enjoy freelancing. I enjoy the only little boss I have is myself. And that's kind of a nice feeling to have. Besides, um, you know, for resumes for people like my age, you start putting them up on a, on a screen, and it, and it gets to be like almost like a... Um, Retirement dinner. <laughs> I feel like you know, geez, this is about the end of the road for me. I can't hold a job. I have all these different different titles. But um, let's see if I can get this to work now. But to, just to recap, real quickly, I've been freelance freelancing as a writer and editor from 2001 to the present. Um, as Kemp was saying, I, I've I've written a weekly newspaper column now. I started writing this weekly column in about 1984 when I worked in Oshkosh at the Oshkosh Northwestern. And my big, my big pride in this column is that I've, writ I've written it now every week since then without missing a week. And so I was, hope I was wondering now, as I'm getting older, how much longer can I keep that streak going? <laughs> so, so it becomes a real, a real just a self-competitive thing where I don't want to ever take, have any excuse for missing that column unless it really is uh, a death-defying situation. Um, also, on the, as Ken mentioned, Archery Trade Association, the ATA, I've been their chief, their chief copy editor for about well, 15 years now. And so I get to work a lot with a lot of young writers and try to make them learn how to write tightly and concisely and not just go rambling off all the time. And you find real quickly that some people appreciate coaching and some people don't. And luckily, the ATA, the Archery Trade Association, values my work enough to where they basically let people know that either, either you've learned how to work with this old guy or you're not going to make it. So I have that going for me. The magazine work, 
these days I've kind of gotten it down to the one magazine I really like working for, writing for, is American Hunter. That's because they kind of let me pick and choose what I want to write about. I don't get too many assignments where they just say, hey, could you write about this or could you write about that? They kind of pick my brain once a year. We sit up for an hour and talk about things that I've been, been working on and how I might be able to make that work for them. And also, um, this summer I started working for my, I, I'm really excited about this. I don't know if you, any of you folks follow the Meat Eater, but there's a, a group called uh, by a guy named Steve Ranella. And Steve's about 44 years old now. He's really got a huge following nationwide. And he's got the most popular podcast and TV show out there on, the, on the, out their networks. And I think the reason that it does so well is he writes a lot about um, cooking and how you, you go out and hunt. It's not just uh, for the hunt, you're not just out there for the antlers. Antlers are important. I like to bring antlers home. I have antlers all over my house. But the biggest thing for, I think, a serious hunter is the meat. And so the Steve and his crew, crew they're really great about making that connection for people and talking about Leopold and all these great things that make hunting a big part of the conservation community. Um, I was also, in the past, the editor of Deer and Deer Hunting magazine, which I think now they have an office, their office is here in Stevens Point somewhere now, but um, I started with them in 1991 when they were still in Appleton as an independent magazine. It was owned by, by two or three guys who started the magazine in the late 70s. Eventually, they sold the Crosby Publications in Iola, and that's where I ended up moving up here uh, to, to Coral Pack back in 1992 to, to continue my work there. Um, I mentioned the columnist stuff. I've been doing that. Uh, it says 83, but I think it's more like 84 when I actually started writing it. And I graduated from UW Oshkosh in 1983. I was in the Navy from 75 to 80, and that was, I could talk all night about how that formed what became my career, helped shape my career, but I'll, I'll, not, I'll tell that story another day. But basically it was the idea that in the Navy I had a lot of time to read. And I really learned the importance of having a good background in political science and history. And I didn't read a whole lot about the conservation movement in those days, but I always liked U.S. history and, and that kind of stuff. I started realizing I had a talent for writing, so I, that's how I, how I got going in that. Um, on the other side, one thing about being a newspaper writer, especially in newspapers, is you, you write for a diverse audience, and not everyone is going to like what you have to say. And so I, I, get, um, I get a fair amount of email these days, and letters still, but mostly email now. And I don't know if you folks are read or watch um, Jimmy Kimmel, the, the comedian on, on Late Night, but he has this, nice, this really good segment called Mean Tweets, where he gets people famous people, when they read um, Twitter stuff that's sent to them, that's really mean, stuff that you know, they really get bashed. And they started doing this um, segment quite often on his TV show, and I thought, God, I was getting mean tweets before there was Twitter. <laughs> so I, and I kept a few of them. And you learn real quick, though, you get, you get comments from people who don't like you, so I, I, I call names like, wanna be out your writer. <laughs> This one guy gave me, his, gave me help on, he thought, um, he, he didn't think too much of my various skills. He told me I couldn't pour water from hip boots the instructions were on the heel. And I, I read that and I recognized that, that idea. And I thought, he stole that from Lyndon Johnson, President mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson. He, he said that about a guy, and I think, I think Johnson's quote was, that guy couldn't, couldn't pour a piss out of a boot and the instructions were on the heel. So I thought, hey, he, stole, he stole President Johnson's idea. Um, but I get these ones that are more serious too, and this one guy wrote to me back in the 90s and said I was, I was, I was a disgraced, a real, true, honest-to-God hunter. And it was all about deer hunting. He didn't like something I'd written about deer hunting. And another guy just called me a horse's ass and various other things. So that, that one I kind of expect, you know, I get that quite often. But some people get a little, a little more violent. This one guy told me that he needed a good whooping. And this guy sent me, got more, got, he sent me, this is um, my picture from the Green Bay Press Gazette back in the 90s. And you can wrote, see what he wrote on my forehead there. And they wrote underneath outdoors, wannabe. And I've, I've, um, I've kept that picture to this day, I still take to my desk. Right above my computer terminal. And I kind of liked that because I thought, 
you know, at least at least I'm getting interaction. People are reading. <laughs> <laughs> but I also learned this that um, journalists haven't been popular for a long time. Can you read that, Mark Twain quote? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Mark, Mark Twain, if you read um, his autobiography, he did not like editors. <laughs> Any time an editor touched his words, touched his punctuation, anything, he got really mad about it. And so I, I was like that one, though, because um, he wrote a really great short story, too, about, um, the, I think it's called The Week I Edited an Agricultural Newspaper. And he, he got the circulation to go way up because he knew so little about farming that he was just winging it all the time. And people start coming by at his window and looking in at him and looking at what he'd written and look at him again and finally realize this is the idiot from journalist. <laughs> um, but this life of the media is constantly reinforced. You know, the, you know, the people who don't like the media always will love me for Donald Trump. That's not exactly a new idea. In 1973, for example, um, we all, I think most of us know Coach Bobby Knight. And Coach Knight did not like sports writers. And one of my favorite quotes I wrote down back then was, um, all of us learned to write in the second grade, most of us go on to other things. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get back to why I'm here. I was asked to discuss CWD and what, what we might expect in the years ahead. This is um, a far side cartoon, Mad Cow Disease. And there's a cow lying on the, on the psychiatrist's couch there. And maybe it's not me, you know? Maybe it's the rest of the herd that's gone insane. <laughs> and if you don't know, a CWD, chronic wasting disease, is basically in that same kind of same family of diseases. There's Mad Cow Disease. There's also a, um, a similar disease in, in, sh in sheep called Scrapie, S C R A P I E. And unfortunately, scrapey sounds a lot like scabies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are, are around Wisconsin, when I go and talk to them, they always are saying scrapies. And they think, no, it's scrapey. And, there's, and it's not a skin disease. Mm -hmm. So anyway, if you hear scrapies being, I mean, being mispronounced as scrapies, keep that in mind. It's not a, an itchy skin disease. It's one of these family, family diseases. It's also, um, in the humans, it's called Christful Jot disease. It's also, um, in, in uh, Great Britain, when they found that, that beef, tainted beef, could spread to the humans, it's a new variant, they call it, a new variant form of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. So it, it, you know, it has jumped the species barrier before, but never, we've never proven it yet with deer, but it's, it's, a, it's still a possibility. But also, what we have, I think what a lot of folks are clinging to, is that we've known about scrapie and sheep for about 200 years, and where it's actually been in, in, the, in our documentation going back you know, for two centuries now, and so far we still don't think scrapie has jumped into, into humans. Since 2002, we, we have learned a lot about these diseases. We know now that um, these prions, which we think cause CWD, you know, at one time we thought it was just in the, in the brain, the spinal tissue, the lymph nodes, and um, eyes, these real nerve-rich areas. And since then, we found that it's also showing up in, in um, uh, the deer's urine, the deer's feces, and also in the meat, but not in the kind of numbers, not the kind of quantities that you, that you find with it in, in more nervous, as it was in the part of the nervous system. So there, there are things that we can do to, to minimize our exposure in that way. The thing that um, I think we also the misinformation you hear so often these days on CWD, one of the things we often hear is that it's everywhere, it's always been here, we just didn't, never did look for it. And that's just not true. It's a fairly recent disease. This is um, a map in 2000. Basically, this is where we knew in 2000 where CWD, CWD was found. And in those days, there's only in a handful of counties in, in Colorado and Wyoming out in the wild and a small number of captive elk farms. <clears throat> and CWD was actually first identified, it was never really identified and given a name and defined by science 
until 1967 when it was found in a research facility out in, out in Colorado. So that's 2000. Here we are in 2004. Now, the light, the light gray boxes in this one, you see, you see, I think you still know a different, because there's light gray and dark gray. The light gray shows CWD in wild populations of deer and elk, 2004. The dark gray ones are the ones that were shown on the previous, period, previous slide, so year 2000. The yellow dots you see scattered across there, those are deer and elk in private captive farms. And the ones that were, um, that were all those yellow ones, those were all at that time what they call depopulated. Basically the government goes in, wipes them all out, and, and hoping that, that by wiping them out they can't spread the disease any further. There's a couple of red dots there too in, in, um, in Colorado, and those are captive facilities where in 2004, that was only two that were active at that time that they thought was still an active disease. Okay, so that's 2004. Now we flip ahead eight years to 2012, and you start seeing this, this disease has not slowed down. And two, starting in 2002, after Wisconsin found CWD, many states started testing for the disease. And in those first few years after 2002, they really weren't finding it in that many places. But 10 years later, by 2012, you can see its known distribution had spread to all sorts of parts of North America. And this map at that time, 2012, was a much better look at where that, where that disease was actually being found. So, we, so there you are, 2012. Now, skipping ahead again, 2017. Now just, just to kind of give you a, this helps me anyway. I'll try to flip back real quickly just to show you again, going backward in time, what we're dealing with. And forward again. And here we are, in the, and this is a year ago. It's now been found in 25 states. And we saw a real big increase last year, 2017, over 10% of the known cases now were first documented just a year ago, over the, you know, over the course of 2017. So that's pretty com compelling evidence, I think, that the disease is spreading nationally and, and up in the Canada, where you see that big block of this area up here in, uh, in the Manitoba and uh, Saskatchewan. Also, um, Wisconsin, we definitely have a problem. In 2002, you can see there, we, we tested 20,236 deer in the southern farmlands. And southern farmlands, in case you, you aren't um, aware of the, how the DNR breaks up the state, this map kind of shows that, I hope you can see that, the southern farmlands basically runs across from, um, I think it's, let's see here, I got it written down, Vernon County, in the west, and all the way over to uh, Ozaki County on the east, and all the way down to the Illinois border. So it's a pretty good chunk, the southern third almost of, of Wisconsin is our southern farmlands. So when you hear statewide discussions of statewide prevalence of CWD, always be a little bit careful because those, we have not done a good job in recent years of testing Wisconsin statewide. There's no rolling system where we're constantly testing counties on a, on a regular basis making sure we have this thing covered. What we have done a pretty good job on, at least on a volunteer basis, is that southern farmland. We've started getting lots of deer tested down there. So in 2002, just in that southern farm, farmland unit, the 1% prevalence, we tested 20,236 deer, and 205 of them were sick. Four years later, 2006, still about 1% 1, 1 prevalence, again, Almost just by coincidence, 20, 205, 25, um, 205 positive, 21,731 total tests. 2007, you start seeing a little movement now. It's one, now 1.9% prevalence. And that year, I want you to look real closely here, between 2006 and 2007, we cut our testing by almost 66% or got it down to 7,192, yet we still had this increase, we still cut that increase, 2% prevalence now. <clears throat> then you jump ahead three years, we're now at 3% prevalence, still about the same number of deer being tested there. 
then go down to 2014, we're now up at eight and a half percent prevalence, just in, that, in this one big area of Wisconsin. Just kind of continuing along there. Last year, we were at 10.6 percent prevalence in, in the farmlands, southern farmlands. And we actually hit uh, 590 out of um, 5,551. Again, though, dropping down, we're, not, we're still not testing as many deer. We're, not, we're still testing there about four, you know, 25 percent of it we were testing just six years or 10 years before. And I, I checked yesterday afternoon, and for this year, just the archery season so far in the southern farmlands, we're now 15 percent right now, but we're still very early in the season, so odds are that number will drop down somewhat over the course of the fall, but you know, you can see it's not going away. I should say too that 10% that rate you saw last year, one thing interesting about that, which kind of gives that, that um, a little more credibility, is that DNR has been doing a, a, a ongoing research down there with live deer, where they're capturing live deer, tagging them, and monitoring them, and they, they, can, they can now do a sample with, you know, it wasn't until recently they started getting fairly confident that they can do some live sampling, but it's a very intensive thing. They, they got to catch the deer, drug it, knock it out, and they, and they snip a little piece of meat right out of their, right out of their anus. They take that in, they, they analyze it, they can, they can find out they, if it's carrying CWD. And in that testing, that first year of data they had, 10% of the deer they captured had CWD. I was down there in February this year, this, this um, you know, nine months ago. And the first two deer they captured that day were two bucks. One was a two and a half year old buck, and one was a one and a half year old buck. And I got pictures of the DNR people um, working with these deer, um, drugging them, doing, that, doing the, this um, sampling. <coughs> Turns out later, both those bucks had CWD. And you wouldn't have known it by looking at them, but they, they, were, they, were, they had it. And it was interesting too, that first full year of data, when they looked at those um, survival rates in the deer that had CWD, what they figured out was that basically, if a deer had CWD, it had three times the chance of, of being dead by, by the end of that year as a healthy deer would. And some, some were shot by hunters, some were hit by, by cars, but what was interesting, you think you know, that they're dying at three times the rate, so chances are that disease, even though we can't detect it with our naked eye, it's affecting their behavior somehow. It's affecting something in them they just can't, they aren't as aware, they aren't as um, wary. There might be something going on with that deer that makes them a little more susceptible to, be, you know, to early death than uh, a healthy deer would be. Excuse me one second, I got something bothering me here. Um, <coughs> we also know that CWD affects our perceptions of what's safe to eat. But I think our first, our first reaction we had to the disease 15 years ago was much worse than it is right now barring another big change. But, I, but I, you might remember when we had CWD first pop mm -hmm. up, I'm trying to get this to move ahead here, here we go. <coughs> that first year in 2002, the, the disease was discovered in, 2000, in February 2002, and that fall during the gun season, our hunting numbers, hunting license sales, dropped off 10%. <coughs> down from like 660, 670,000 down to 618,000. Just that fast it, it plummeted. And I would like this quote from Tom Heberlein, uh, he's a girl sociologist at Madison. If someone from PETA had asked me in 2001 to create a plan to cut deer license sales by 10%, reduce the kill by even more within one year, I would have said it's impossible. That's how scared people got, you know, that, that initial time off. <coughs> But you know, when you think back in that time, though, we had never seen a deer disease in Wisconsin, really, a real, you know, kind of gut-wrenching one. We knew about t we knew about tuberculosis over in Michigan. They had some tuberculosis up there. We've also had TB show up in captive herds, but never have we seen CWD pop up across the Mississippi River. In Wisconsin, in those days, we hadn't even seen um, another famous, another well-known deer disease, but it's not one that is chronic is um, epi epizootic epi hemorrhagic disease. That one kills deer too, but it tends to come in waves where it kills them off, kills a, a little pocket of deer off, basically. And then then the, once you um, get a good hard freeze, it kills these little, little flies that spread the disease, then the disease goes away until we have another, another outbreak. But CWD, once it's in the herd, it stays in the herd. And, and you know, temperatures, 
whether well, don't um, affect it. But what was interesting, uh, we had that initial big wave of hysteria, but then by 2007, five years later, things started to calm down. And when the DNR, when the DNR finds the US that it has positive for CWD, they contact the hunter and let them know that your deer tested positive. They don't just send out a card and say your deer tested positive, they actually call them. When they found out that, four, that basically 40% of the guys being called to let them know that um, their deer was sick, it was carrying CWD, they already started eating it. And I guess that's just a choice we have to make as individuals. If, we, if, we, if we're like really that confident that, that meat won't be tainted, won't be carrying something that we could, you know, that could, be, could spread into humans. Now I say I don't want to be the first case of um, chronic waste disease jumping into humans and becoming you know, crazy for jock disease. So I know I'm not like willing to take, the t take that chance for myself, let alone for my, my grandkids. So I still, I'm still, I still wait to get my test results back. Other people, though, um, and I, I'm one of these people too, um, we have other people to think about here, and especially this person, I always call it Benison's middle woman, the middle man here. I'm not sure what um, you guys call your wife, your spouse, um, but in Wisconsin um, we have, let's see here, the wife, I hear that one a lot. <laughs> and our, some people can say, the wife. But really, in so many homes, as couples, as married couples, as, as, as partners, we tend to discuss these things, but I think ultimately, if you run a roadblock to your spouse, that venison all of a sudden isn't so treasured anymore. And I, I, um, I think that's a shame. I really, I hate to think of something so great as venison being looked at that way, but I think by, by ignoring this disease too much, I think we're, we're forcing people to make those kind of decisions where they're not like, informed decisions, but we're scaring the hell out of people and not letting them decide for themselves. So I, I hope we take a more reasoned approach as we go along with this disease, and not just keep ignoring it like some people do. Um, plus, there's liabilities out there. Last year, I did a story about a big sausage making company in Oshkosh that was no longer taking venison in for, um, for sausage processing. They just didn't want the liability because there's no, you know, we don't really have rules and regulations telling people they got to tell the sausage maker where it comes from. They recommend you do, and they recommend the sausage maker to ask. A lot of them don't ask anymore, so you don't you really don't know where some of this meat's coming from that goes in the sausage. And then in some places, too, they mix the sausage with other guys' meat, so you have that liability. So rather than deal with that, some companies are saying, no, I won't. Well, we won't deal with that. But then I, but then I, read, I read a really interesting story about a, a week or two ago of course, came across on Facebook, and I tracked it down. I thought, well, it actually is legitimate. But there's a, a sausage, sausage maker up in uh, West Central Wisconsin, and he basically is telling his customers, if you have taken your venison in for for, um, for testing, don't don't bring it to me, don't bring the rest to me, and then tell me to wait while it's being tested, because he doesn't believe in CWD, he doesn't think it's a problem, he doesn't want to be bothered with it. And I thought, well, that's an interesting take. I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so confident. But, as I say, CWD is not going away. I've, I've criticized the DNR a lot, especially in the last eight years, about not doing a real good job to stay on top of the monitoring of this disease, making it totally voluntary, not making a rolling man mandatory testing. There's lots of things we could be doing to make a, give, give us a much better look at what CWD is doing in this state. One thing that DNR has done consistently well for the last 16 years, it's very good about gathering CWD data that it has and putting it on its websites. But then it, it kind of leaves it up to you to go out and look for it and hunt it down and interpret it for yourself. But these, are, these charts I'm about to show you are all from the DNR website. You just have to know where to go find them. This first one here, this is north central Iowa County, basically the area where my buck I showed you earlier came from. And you can see, just kind of take a look at that graph, you can see it, it kind of stays flat until about 2006, 2008. Then it starts going up pretty dramatically, and that blue line there, and it says adult male, 
that's um, basically any buck two and a half years or older. That's what that age group is. That, that solid yellow line is adult does two and a half and older. And the dotted lines, again, uh, yearling bucks, the dotted blue line, and the yellow line, these are all the same from next few charts too. That's the, the yearling does. <clears throat> now in this graph here, the adult bucks, two and a half and older, 56% of them are infected in that in that area. This is a, a township, um, it's basically township seven and eight in range three, four E, basically right in the center, top part of Iowa County. And 56% of the bucks are, are infected, the adult bucks, adult dole is about 35%. And one thing we've learned too, when I've heard just about 35% of the dole population being infected, it's not going to be very long that herd will, will start declining. It, we don't think they, they don't think they've gotten there yet, but that but that's probably not too far off in the future now for this part of part of that county. This is northwestern Iowa County. Here the, the prevalence is a little bit lower. 42 percent for, for the adult males and 25 percent for the adult females. But I, this one here, if you, if you remember, just look back on that chart. That one there, you can see that one took a little bit quicker, quicker um, ride, ride to the um, skyward. <coughs> and this one in northwestern Iowa County, you see it, it started off slower. It kind of stayed down that flat area until about 2010, 2011, then it started declining. Southeast Iowa County, you see it in a little different there again. All these little things, this, this, this disease is not consistent in how it operates. But here again, we have adult males. 37% of them, over one third of them, are, are sick. In South Central Iowa County, again, you see that big spike going up fast for the adult bucks. And they're at 45% prevalence. This is an area um, where I hunt a lot. My late uncle and aunt, their, their family farm in, in uh, Richland County. Actually, um, I'm a little bit north of this area, but this is not too far from where I, where I hunt. And that blue line again, that, this was an interesting one because in the early 2000s, they were not finding CWD in that area. They found it a couple times, then nothing for a couple of years, and all of a sudden it started going. When it took off, it took off. 45% prevalence. So basically, when you look at these, this chart here, you think when I see an adult buck go running by these days, you know, not too far south of where I hunt, it's a coin flip whether the, we're not sick or not. And Southwest South County, just right across the border, basically, same kind of situation. 53% adult bucks, adult does 33%. And this is a real odd one. Usually you don't see CWD showing up in these deer until they're about two and a half, three and a half years old. But, he, but here, yearling does, that, that yellow dotted line, is tracking exactly as the, as the adult does. Now what it is, no one really knows. But again, one of these mysteries of that disease that we're still trying to learn. And this is right across the, the county line in southwest Dane County. Look at how slow this one's going. This one's been, they've been tracking this one up for 15, 16 years, but look at that much slower um, movement there and how that disease is going. 18% prevalence in bucks, 10% in does. Devil's Lake area north of there, northwest of there. Again, real slow development there. And then southeastern Wisconsin, this is the area down, this is, this is basically this little, this monitoring area is right along the Rock County and Walworth County <coughs> line, just east of Janesville. Again, a, yeah, pretty much a flat line there, but still, we're at 10% there in the adult buck population, 5% the adult doe. I guess what's, what I've been harping about for many years now, though, is that many lawmakers still aren't all that concerned about it. And a few of them, and very few of them, want to spend money on it. One note from my column from this week, which will appear like, I think it starts running in, in Friday's um, online editions. Um, I've always been puzzled why Governor Walker and Dean our secretaries like Kathy Stepp and then now Dan Meyer, they don't go out on public service ads and encourage hunters to get their deer tested. You know, you know they should be doing it. The Department of Health encourages you to get your deer tested. They tell you not to eat it if it's infected. And yet, we can't get our governor 
or our dean, our secretaries, to just go out and do a public service announcement and encourage people to get out there and get the deer tested. Nothing else. If you're not worried about for your own sake, at least worry about for the deer's sake and the, and the herd's sake to figure out where this disease is, where it's getting worse, and where it's not, where it's not doing so bad. Just keep, you know, help, help us get a good, good handle on things. And also um, mentioned um, funding for it. The DNR's CWD budget has only averaged 1.14 million annu annually since 2012. You know, 1.1 million for a disease that's important. That's half of what we were spending in 2008 through 2011, when we were averaging 2.21 million, and only a quarter of what it was in 2004, 2007, when, when it came down from, we were spending upwards of, you know, I think it was over 11, for 11 million or so, even higher, a couple of those years, we were doing um, really comprehensive testing. So it came down to 5 million, then the 2.2, now 1.1, and we're, we're now at a point we're testing basically record low numbers of deer in recent years, but finding record high numbers of, of sick deer. So I guess that, that worries me. And with that, I'll just kind of wrap this up. And I'm hoping you'll have some questions. We don't have to talk all about CWD, but if you want to talk about CWD and ask me more questions about it, I'll do my best to answer it. You can turn the lights on now, thank you. How do you go about using your deer testing? What do you have to do? What's the procedure? Um, this year, one thing that Dino is doing this year, under pressure, what it's doing is they're, they're having more, they're putting on a lot more self-serve kiosks. So you can go on the DNR website, if you just type in sampling, you know, it'll bring up a, a county-based system that shows you where these different places are where you can get sacred deer and get it tested. Now also this time, I'll let this young man over here stand up and say a few words about what, he, what services he offers. Hi, uh, I live in Southern Portage County, a little north of Allen, and we have three people, uh, two people and me, who will uh, sample your deer for you. I've got some business cards here with our telephone numbers on them. Uh, we just ask that uh, you have to bring the deer to us. Uh, bring either the head and an attached six inches of the neck or bring the whole deer uh, if you're taking it for processing or something stop by my telephone number is the first one on the top I'm mostly retired so I do most of the sampling but we remove the nodes from the deer and package them and get information from you as to where the deer was uh, killed, etc., and uh, then those get picked up at the DNR. They get sent to Madison, and uh, then they will be tested there. And you will receive notice if it's positive or negative. Uh, if it's negative, you'll get a postcard in the mail. <clears throat> so sometime after the meeting, stop by, and if you're interested, and I'll give you a card. I don't know of any. Other people uh, who are sampling, taxidermists will sample, for example. Uh, I don't have names, but if you go to the DNR website, uh, you can find uh, information, and there are also these kiosks that are around in certain um, places. How many of you folks have smartphones? Uh, quite a few. If you go on, the DNR now has a, a new app out there, too, for. Um, that basically helps do everything from find, finding public lands to finding kiosks and finding um, places to be taken for sampling. So there are there are ways to find that information fairly quickly. Even out in the field, if you have a signal, you should be able to figure out where you can go nearby to drop off a deer, or drop off the, the, the parts for sampling. Uh, I'm not sure when, but it's fairly recently. There was a study done in Canada that was a collaboration between Canadian and German. Uh, scientists and they had found they basically were studying to see if, if CWD was transmissible to I think macaques. Right, right. And they had different phases to that study. But can you talk more about that? I can try. Um, they found it's been it's been some dispute on that study. You know, some people, some of the scientists aren't quite sure they they agree with all the methodology involved. But basically, the macaque monkey. I think, is, if I understand this right, is one of these species that's fairly close 
in this little chain of, um, it's not like, um, what do you call it? It's not one of these evolutionary chains or anything, but it's still, it's one of these, it's a monkey that's really close to, to humans as far as its overall makeup. So when they're able to find, by feeding this, these monkeys, they're feeding it, not just injecting, but feeding it uh, infected meat, CWD meat, some of them got sick. It was a, I think it was like about half of them or so on, and that once they got sick from it, got the, got the disease, it jumped the species barrier and moved along. But there are so many complications in, in um, how these diseases move. You know, there, there's some where they, they found that, like in, in, um, in mad cow disease, the cows don't give it to each other by licking, by grooming, by you know sharing food to where it might be. Like deer can, can transmit deer to deer. They don't quite know how, but, it, but it, they think it's happening. Where cows can't do that. Wait, they, wait cows got sick from their form of um, this, these they call bovine spongiform encephalopathy, I think it's called. The way they got sick was um, they were being fed rendered um, protein from previous um, dead dead cows, and so when they start eating this this, this rendered stuff from um, the cows that came before them, that's how it spread. But it wasn't from um, you know contact one on one. Deer, they don't think to do it that way. They don't think it's coming up that way. But there's so many things we don't know yet. I guess what really frustrated me a lot with um, some of my covers like 10 years ago, you had these cases where. Um, I remember Senator Tiffany from up north was calling the CWD funding a boondoggle. And I asked him, well, what, what level of funding isn't a boondoggle? You know, and so he, said, he threw a number up there like um, 10 million or something. And I, I guess I find it fascinating that here we have a, a wildlife disease. I think, how long have we been studying cancer in humans? And we talk about firing all the all these doctors because they can't figure out how to like, cure cancer. No, you don't fire people for that, but here we had senators and um, something went calling for people to be fired because they couldn't sell CWD. I think, well, you know, humans can tell you where it hurts. What does a deer tell you? We don't know. And so I always find some of these things that we do to people, we do to these professionals, these, these scientists, really unfair to hold them that kind of standard where either you solve this or to cut off all your funding. So. Uh, that's been, a, been a, for me kind of a, a real contradiction that I, I struggle with when I try to talk to some of these, these um, politicians on these issues. Um, this, right here in front. I'll, I'll get you next. Okay, with the, doing the testing, how long does it take before you get a result? Yeah, that's one thing that Wisconsin has gotten a lot better at. Um, I, I have a, I brought a piece of paper I can show you after, afterward. I hesitate to have it, all these too many charts because in fact it starts getting hard to follow, but really in, in, in the last few years now, they've turned those tests around, but usually, usually within a week, you can get the results back. So I know like what I always recommend you do is just, like, I've always been one of these people that process to do myself. Like my wife and I, we, we still have our daughters around, the daughters would help too. But we, we basically package it up, put it in the freezer, and wait for the test results to come back. And the thing that we're so safe though these days, we always still have to make sure people understand that that's still not a food safety test. All it tells you is they did, they did not detect CWD. It doesn't mean it's not there, it just means they didn't detect it. But it's still, it's the best we can do, and I figure, well, if it's the best we can do, I can live with that. So, but usually it's only a few days, these days. Next. One of the reasons that I, I wanted to come here is because I wanted to learn more about chronic wasting. Um, my husband passed away two and a half years ago from CJD here in Wisconsin. Yeah. And um, I've been going to the um, CJD Foundation has a convention um, in Washington, D.C. And for the last two years, um, chronic wasting has been brought up. And out of all the states, Wisconsin is the hot spot. And oh, definitely. Definitely. The other thing is that CJD cases has gone up 200 percent in Wisconsin, yeah. and when we took my husband to the hospital, one of the first questions they asked, "Are you a deer hunter? Mm -hmm. Have you eaten venison?" Right. And so that kind of scares me. Well, it, it's scary, but it's, it's just, I look at that too, though, as being um, doing their due, dil due diligence. You know, because there's, they... there's a lot of research going on right, right now yeah. on if. Um, if there is a, a going to be, end up being a right. 
Well, Dave Clausen is a former DNR board member. He's a veterinarian. And he has been real critical of how Wisconsin's been handling CWD. And like, I think it was last year in this hot area we talked about, um, probably about 10% of that, the deer being shot there, being tested. And so you think, how many thousands of deer carcasses are going home and being consumed without even a test being done? And so Dave Klausnoy says this is the biggest experiment in the world right now on the impact of um, CWD on humans. Will it be something that turns up you know, down the road to be um, that, that, it has it, that it was able to mutate and spread? We don't know that right now, but it, you can't rule it out. That, that, that possibility is there. Um, I think someone else had a hand up first, but I'll come back to you now. Ken. Uh, Patrick, if uh, indeed this disease does pass from deer to humans, what happens to our deer hunting? Well, I think it goes, it goes to nothing, I think, or close to nothing. I think it'd just be a devastating, um, terrible thing for, um, for deer hunting and in the hunting community. I mean, I think in my lifetime, I think we've gone from um, where, when I was a kid growing up, we mainly hunted rabbits and squirrels. And then a couple, couple times a year, we go out deer hunting during the gun season and, and the bow season. It was, it was just kind of a recreational thing. Not a, um, wasn't, wasn't our main driver the way it is now. Deer hunting in, in my lifetime has gone to be, be the number one driver of the DNR's funding system. Um, it's basically its overall funding system. So for a state like Wisconsin to lose the deer hunting opportunity and the deer hunting funding mechanism that we've relied on so long now, it would be devastating. And I, I hope it doesn't happen. And, but I think that that's something I, I worry about a lot because I think too, I, I, um, I make a lot of my money on a personal point. Basically, deer hunting has become an industry. It's a huge thing for um, equipment. It drives the sales in this, in this country, basically, you know, deer hunting. So it, it's got so many things weaving through here that we have to worry about. Um, I think we have a woman right there. Thank you. Um, okay, a deer test positive. How do they destroy that? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Now, there's still people who think you can take care of it by um, just cooking your meat thoroughly. That has nothing to do with it. You know, you have to basically get that thing up to where it'd be you know, incinerated. It's so, like there's been some hope that by doing um, more regular um, brush burning and um, well, these control burns out in the, on the woods, on the, in the countryside that we can have some impact there. But it's still not something that you can, in some of those situations you have like a um, oh, wet, under understory and um, well, not not quite peat. But that kind of you don't get that real hot blazing temperature you need to to, to destroy something like a, like these prions. So they do have all these. I think they're called tissue digesters or something down in Madison that they take the stuff there and destroy it and, and those things. It can't be fed to anything any other animal. Like it shouldn't that. be. No. Okay. Yeah. I, I but, just asked because some years ago I were ever. Gold Scholar, and we went to visit a wolf uh, <coughs> preserve. Yeah. And they were relying sort of on people who would bring in wolf oh, sure. deer, you know. Yeah. And so they could not use it for that, right? Yeah, and there's still, um, you, well, you shouldn't. Because, yeah. you know, there's some, I guess, one of those things we don't really know for certain how this disease could mutate eventually. And that's one, one of the theories is that, or one of the many theories you hear about is that we know the prions can, can move through plants in the root systems you know, in, in soil, up to the plants, out in the leaves. But then is it in, in enough quantities to actually infect someone? We don't know that. We don't know when, they, when a deer is out in the field and urinating on, on farm plants, how much of that can be, can be passed along in the, in the food chain. Or when it gets bailed up in the hay and shipped across the country and do, dropped off on our farm. <coughs> All of these different ways. It even, um, could even be transferred through mud, stuck on tires, you know. So, <coughs> If you walk into some of these, um, these deer farms, you know, those folks are in the real strict controls too. I mean, people always, I mean, I have real mixed feelings about deer farms and elk ranches too, but they actually are pretty tightly regulated, at least the best we can do it. And they can't just drive in and out of their fences with, with their farm equipment. That stuff's got to be kept in the, inside those places, at least it, it shouldn't be brought out. So there's all sorts of restrictions we have, but still we don't really know for sure 
how that stuff's being transferred. It's just all these different possibilities. Is that something that deer, that a bird can pick up, <coughs> fly out, take a crap somewhere else, and leave it, leave a new deposit there? We don't know. It, yeah. it's, it, but it's conceivable. Well, it seems right now there's just too many uh, un, uh, unanswered questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's. And the thing is, we won't find those answers if we don't yeah. do research. Yeah. And so a lot of it, a lot of it's cut off yeah. that way. I think I saw a hand way up in the back. Is that? No? Okay. You, I have to ask, I'll, I'll come back to you. What have they done out west? This is where it originated, isn't it? Yeah, and out, out there they're finding now, like in parts of Wyoming, in parts of Colorado, where their herds, they actually are documenting declines now in their, in their herd size. And there's a place in Wyoming where the, the antler sizes, the bucks aren't growing to those older ages anymore. So, so these areas that were some of the most coveted areas to hunt, and I think it's like in southeastern Wyoming, some of those areas not, aren't growing as big bucks anymore just because they don't grow old. So they have their problems too. It, it, it isn't just um, <coughs> Wisconsin, we have some bad problems out west too. Yes, sir. How long after they catch it? That, 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 I, I think usually they're done within two years, one and a half, two years. They're usually they're done. You know. and, and, and I should have said it, it's, uh, it's always fatal. Once a deer gets this disease, they, they don't recover from it, it's, it, it kills them. And, the, and there are some strains of different deer where they live a little bit longer by a few months, but they eventually die too. And then the folks who are always hoping <coughs> and, and clinging to the idea that eventually evolution will come along and then you know, they will work their way through it and think, well, in the best we can judge there would be hundreds of years probably for that to, for that to occur. So it's, again, I, I guess I'm... Um, I'm not sure we can do much about sometimes, but, but I know we are trying real hard, so it's hard to say you know, what, our, what our capabilities are. Okay, sir. Uh, there's numerous diseases that can be spread through ticks, and ticks feed on deer. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Have they done any studies looking for prions in the ticks? I don't think they've the found ticks? any kind of link like that. But, um, have they, have, I, they, yeah. have they done studies of ticks looking for prions? I don't, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. I'm sure they have, but I just not, I'm, not, mm -hmm. I'm personally not aware of it. Patrick. Are we done? Uh, well done. Okay. <laughs>